Blitz is defined as a sudden, savage attack. It is indeed all this. The effect is sure. The premise is simple. It's a basic, primal confrontation, man to man. No excuses are offered. None except. Welcome to the latest edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Looks like a radio station. Now, here are your hosts, lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers. Pure athlete, yeah. I transcend race, hombre. Matt Butler. I don't talk <laughs> man. I back it up. And we are talk full of that, man. That's right. And Jeff Howe. It's still real to me, damn it. <laughs> and that's the bottom line. Cause Stone Cold said so. If you're gonna blitz, come strong. But don't come at all. Coming strong with another edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. And thank goodness camp is about done and we're almost a game week. Because I'm pretty much tired of... Writing and talking and dealing with everything not related to an actual game and game week. So hypotheticals, yes, not hypotheticals in the offseason. See, you're one know. of the dying breed that's actually into the action and not the transaction, because everybody's into the transaction of sports and not the action. I'm still an old school into the action too. Yeah, that's why the NBA offseason is uh, better than the regular season. And there you go. What is now with the Warriors? It wasn't always that. <laughs> yeah. the Warriors now that is since LeBron. Yeah. But uh, we're not here. Everyone. We're not here to talk about basketball, but in the spirit of Allen Iverson. And we do have to talk about practice, and we will talk about Texas. The Longhorns, guys, at this point, basically done with camp. The second scrimmage is in the books. I I feel good that we let the Blitz audience know ahead of time that, hey, the second scrimmage is usually, in case you forget how camp works, that's usually when camp is pretty much over at the second scrimmage. Once you hit the practice field that following week, you're moving on to Maryland, and Tom Herman said this week the players hit the field on Monday before an off day on Tuesday. Uh, they're already starting with Maryland. They did about 20 minutes of scout work on Monday. Uh, they're back on the practice field on Wednesday. And from here on out, it's all about Texas. Uh, 23rd in the Associated Press poll, guys, in the first AP poll. Number 23 ranked Texas getting ready to take on Maryland at FedEx Field. We'll talk a little bit about that and wrap up camp here on this week's edition of the Blitz. Let me bring in the rest of the team. He is the master of the soundboard, the drop machine extraordinaire, Matt Butler. Matt, how's it going, man? Going pretty well. Enjoying, uh, man, there was some good music in town this weekend, but when you say football season, it's like football's ready to go. And it's the Longhorns intertwining those two this year with some news, too. Correct. The man who intertwines everything because he is the Renaissance man here on Longhorn Blitz. You hear him every day on 104.9 of Horn, AM 1260, 1019. Streaming worldwide on the Horn app, hornfm.com. Rod, did I get all of it in there? Uh, I think, I think that's, so. I think that's all your mediums. I think that's all your mediums, but anyway. Weekdays 1 to 3. I didn't even know it existed. Exactly. <laughs> weekdays 1 to 3 on the Rodcast. He is our lockdown corner here on the show. Lifetime Longhorn, 2002 UT All-American, 2002 semifinalist. For the Jim Thorpe Award, fourth round draft choice of the New York Giants in 2003. Spent his NFL career with the Giants, Lions, Bears, Bucks, Broncos, and a year with the Hamilton Tiger Cats of the CFL. When he was done with football, got himself back to Austin, Texas in a 40 acres where he earned his degree. If he knew where his tea ring was, he would wear it proudly. But nevertheless, he is a car. Caring member oh, wow. of DBU, number 21 yeah. in your program, number one in your hearts, Mr. Rod Babers. And let's stop. And we me. need like a breaking news <laughs> sounder. Sure. That's straight up no. like, yeah, yeah, I can't believe that happened. That was Went peer pressure. There. That's yeah. Jeff's peer pressure. So, so oh, it took what, five, four years or something? So you have, or, this is legit. This is not a bit. No, you have, have legit ordered a tea ring, a new tea ring. Yeah, and we ordered one from the, the tea association. Now, so. who'd you talk to at the tea association? You talked to Ricky Brown? Uh, no, tea? well, I, actually, that's Ricky Brown was the one initially was like, no, you need to come on over here, man. We'll, we can get it. We take that's care of That's old school Ricky uh, Brown. That's fullback Ricky yeah. Brown. Yeah. Uh, so I, but I've talked to Ricky a, a few times. Actually, Ricky's doing a really good job of uh, actually expanding the tea association. Yes, he is. Which is the sleeping giant in this uh town i mean it is a sleeping giant if everybody yes. anybody runs it correctly and figures out how to run it uh, it really could be a huge uh really charitable entity whatever you really want it to be support entity uh kind of support structure for texas football texas sports whatever anyway uh, i did go over there and i did order a new t-ring look at that rod That's b hardcore. got the t-ring yeah. yes uh, congratulations yeah Got the tea ring. So well, I don't have it, but it's already It's on process. its way, yes. Yeah. Thank you, members of the Blitz family, for pestering Rod whenever you see him out at a remote or something, Amen. reminding him to go get his tea ring. <laughs> my mom, my well, woman wanted it really bad, too. She wanted me to get it done. So so are you going to wear it now or just not wear it and defeat the purpose? It, honestly, exactly. Because just I don't want to lose it. Yes, again. yes. I used to wear it all the time. And that's how I lost it because I yeah. wore it almost every day. 
and it's no, it's not smart. Defeats the every purpose. Day. This is like a trophy now. I yeah, I didn't realize that. You so. know, you do have to wear it one time. I will wear it like for events. And well, stuff. because Travis, the best damn videographer in a podcast game, we need visual evidence on this show. Oh, no, when don't I bring do it in. The T ring exists. That's true. Yes. When, it, when I get it, I will wear it here once. But yeah. I agree, I'm not gonna wear it a lot. I it's, don't want to lose it again. Speaking of Ricky it. Brown and the job Ricky's doing, you know how I know Ricky's doing a good job and he means business. Why? I can't think of the last time I saw Ricky Brown out in public where he was wearing something other than a button down shirt. Like if you're wearing button down yeah. shirts everywhere, yeah. that means you're somebody mm. important. I see him always in sport coach. Yeah, he's always in a place yeah. for me. Anytime I go to like a highbrow charitable e- a charity event or some other highbrow event, Ricky Brown's usually there. That's good representation of the diversity yeah. of just the backfield. Look at that backfield. Ricky Williams on one side, Ricky Brown. Two Rickies and very different, you would say, afterwards. Ricky Brown's one of those guys that, I mean, there's a lot of folklore and legend around Ricky Brown. Yeah. We'll get into it. I want to be crass on the show. I'd yeah. like to hear the fullback legend because there is about Will well, Matthews as well. But there was a lot of fullbacks. all right. But <laughs> I don't know what he's it, – it's got a lot going on there. Got a well, lot going on. And Ricky Brown's a blessed, a blessed man. Let's well. <laughs> I'm just saying, right. it is like Cleve Bryant style, like it's crazy. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah. On that no, note, no, no. let's it's, go. <laughs> no, seriously, what you saying? I like all like, the details. Yeah, I mean, you you want want some like, inside you info? Look, you couldn't look away sometimes. Like that is that real? Like what the? What is that? Like yeah, you one of those guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's you guys on the team. Like that. I mean, even as a man, you like. And when I'm you're a talking about out of man, all, like, what the hell is that? A hundred like, different what? humans in there. That's Who? a sample size. Dude, I'm telling you, it was like we used to talk about it all the time. Like that's crazy. He's a one percenter. Uh, yeah, that's no question about that. That's just true. He could if he, he didn't have football, he could always rely on a certain other adult uh, industry gold. to pay bills. Uh, not to be crass or crude, but is is it like the old Ric Flair adage of the baby's arm holding the apple? Man, I'm telling you, it was like it's. I I mean, I I don't want to describe the detail because it's been a while. So you remember, you might. It's been a minute. I I do remember it was prodigious. (laughs) (laughs) That's a great way to put it. That line from uh, No Country for Old Men. He's like, well, I hope it's made quite an impression on me. (laughs) I'm serious. Like everybody, you could ask any uh, football player during that time. I was like, Ricky Brown. Oh yeah, Ricky Brown. Respect. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they made the head of the T Association. Yeah. <laughs> prodigious, as, as, as Craig Way would say, prodigious clout. <laughs> yeah. He's That's in like, hey, I do, uh, make him the head of the T Association. Everybody respects him. Yeah. All right. Put though. it on like, the I, table. I, everybody respects him. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go ahead and move on to camp. And, uh, you know, Tom Herman, Rod, you were talking about mm-hmm. hypotheticals. That's usually what we deal in during camp. Tom Herman was on, on campus then. He may know. He was on campus Somebody, then. somebody should ask him about Ricky Tom Brown. Tom Herman should ask, about, ask Tom Herman about Ricky Brown. I will Brown not ask Tom Maybe Herman about like Ricky Brown. Please, like, no. uh, if I ever go really, back to a press conference, do, I'll do, do that. He would know. He would know, trust me, because he used to hang out with like the players back then. Because he was a he was a nobody back then. GAs uh, GAs hang out with the nobody. players. Yeah, yeah, back then they talked to the players. Around. Trust yeah. me, he knows about Ricky Brown. He was okay. on the offensive side of the ball too. He was an yeah. offensive Dude, GAs. he knows because Greg Davis knew. We was always joking about everybody. He was joking about it. no, he knows. <laughs> uh, it was it was coming out. All right, well, let's move on to some Sorry. hypotheticals that are no longer hypotheticals. I'm just uh, yeah. Tom Herman. <laughs> Guys, I, w- I was a little surprised that he went ahead and announced stuff when he did. I figured he would wait until his game week press conference on Monday, but he figured, hey, we already know we're planning for Maryland. Why wait? Sam Ellinger's your starting quarterback. Calvin Anderson's your starting left tackle. Right tackle, still a battle between Derek Kerstetter and Sam Cosme. That'll continue this week. The kicking battle will also continue this week with Chris Nagar, Cameron Dicker, and Joshua Rowlin. That, that's a great competition of names, though. <laughs> that Nagar, Nagar, guy. Nagar, Dicker, the kicker. Dicker and What's that the other guy? Nagar guy. And, and Joshua the Rowlin. Cousin, the Aussie ah, cousin. He's wow. going to lose because his game's name is not as good. I want Nagar or I want Dicker. That Nag- Dicker Nagar the guy. I know. We used to call him Nagar. Nagger. <laughs> the Nagger. Nagger guy. Like the old, the old South Park skit. The old South <laughs> Park Wheel of Fortune. People yeah. who annoy you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> naggers. We were looking for the Naggers. <laughs> So gold. Yeah, so the kicking competition is going to go on a little more. Se- uh, before we go on to quarterbacks, Rod, starting secondary is set, and we knew this for yeah. really since the start of camp. It's but amazing, actually. Tom Herman said it's nailed down. Caden Stearns and Brandon Jones are your starting safeties. A healthy Devontae Davis will start at corner opposite mm-hmm. Chris Boyd with P.J. Locke in the nickel. So, Rod, this means, and you've done some great research on this, I'm actually going to put Rod's research into an article form at Horse 24-7 uh, before we get to game week. But, Rod, Caden Stearns nailing down that safety spot. Yeah. Nobody slabbed him for it. John Bonney decided he wasn't going to get it, so he was gone. He tra- grad transferred yeah. to Texas Tech. Crazy, uh, right? If you're going to start – 
as a true freshman a true at Texas freshman day one. then day from one. day one, <laughs> then you're pretty special. Yeah. Um, Crazy. And I did I I, I forgot I actually did this for Malik, I think. Mm-hmm. Initially I did it for Malik. Right. Because I wanted to see how many true freshmen or even a red shirt freshman, which has a little bit of a, an advantage. Yeah. Have actually yeah, started Blake game one for Texas. Um, and I want to say I got to 29. It was the number that I got to. Uh, here, because we can only that. track it back to 1992. It's that, as far yeah. back as I could go on the Texas sports website. Mm. So I tried to go. I mean, I, you can't really do it outside of that because before that, the internet is is just it's, it's non-existent. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say it's crap. No, it's non-existent. You have to so connect newspapers. I would have to literally go to some like a library or somewhere and get, like go. I mean, I you could you that. could look I mean, online. I could go to the new library. And they probably would have the records. Have there. You could look online for box scores, but then you'd have to look at names and numbers and correlate that with the roster and hope and the, the roster oh, data is would right. Be, it would just be exhausting. That's right. assuming every single student. Had Men put it all in correctly. Exactly. Um, so, okay, so basically here's the research that I, I found about this, and I'll just give you the exact stat. Okay, so Texas, um, in the time that I we, 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 we threw it out there, the, since 1992, uh, Texas has had um, 20, I want to make sure I get this stat right. Um, yeah, it had 29. Yeah. All right, so 29 true are red shade freshmen that have started game one since 1992. Mm. Caden Stearns is the 30th, or will be the 30th, because they already say it's going to start unless something crazy happens, and I some wood to knock on there. All right, so six of those 30 are still on campus right now. Hmm. Uh, well, really seven of the 30, because Caden Stearns will be the 30th. So right. seven of those 30 are still on campus. So of the other 23, um, I want to say 13 of the 23 were drafted later on in their careers. 11 of those 23... Red shirt or true freshman to start game one for Texas since 1992 were all Americans. Seven were consensus or unanimous all Americans. Um, 17 of the 23 received some type of all conference honors, uh, whatever it is. And four won national awards, and five were first round draft picks. Yeah. Uh, one of those actually, I kind of cheated there, was, um, was a baseball first round draft pick. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't specify sport. Yeah, he was a baseball first round draft pick, not a, not a NFL Clever football writing. draft pick. So I, yeah, the first round draft pick thing is technically true, but it not it's not about football. So, so first, like Oklahoma, Kyler Murray would already be one. Yeah, exactly. He's so their Kyler. The, that really, was shape. My point is that the the ceiling is extremely high for these individuals, and the the rate of development seems to be accelerated. Um, for for them, their own accelerated path, and those guys include, like you said, Shea Marins, but you got guys like Earl Thomas mm-hmm. and uh, Ricky Williams and um, Dan Neal and Bl- Blake Brockemeyer and Michael Huff and Quandre Diggs and Cole McCoy, Justin Blaylock, Blake Gideon, Shane Bouchelles on that list. As a matter of fact, three of the four first round draft picks for the Longhorns in the last draft, Malik, Longball Dixon, Connor Williams, mm-hmm. were all. Guys who started the very first game of their college football yeah. career, and I immediately as freshman or freshman. Right. Yeah, because when you think of like a player coming in and doing that, it's either like your traditional five star guy, or it's the the guy like Gideon that just mentally the quarterback of the defense from day one. Yeah. And like when you look at the guy like Stearns, what you hear it's like you almost are combining the two. That's what I felt because it's a guy yeah. like Gideon out there that early in yeah. such a valuable position, and it's sort of like well, that backfield the last time we remember and. We saw it with him and then the redshirt freshman version of Earl Thomas. But when you look back, it's a really hard position. And having him do that this early be just so amazing, especially when you're running out guys that have been on the field the last oh, yeah. couple of years. And that's an experienced secondary. Yeah. yeah. You know I mean, you got experienced guys back there. And as you point out, Jeff, he won that job before. In the spring, <laughs> and, and I don't even know how many of those jobs were won during the spring. I think most of them had to be won during training camp. I would, yeah, because before guys were coming in early, and he's in it early. Should have been in Lee. high school. So got to go track back when early in Row Lee started. But it's hard to win a job just during the spring. Won that job during the spring? That's un- unheard. As a think about freshman. what you're As a d- true freshman, and not even think about what you're doing your spring break of your senior year of high school because that's what he was doing. That's yeah. how young it he's was a, when he won it by then. Yeah, he's got a Michael Huff, Earl T- Earl Thomas type ceiling. Which yeah. is a Thorpe Award winner type silly. Yeah. Quandre yeah. Diggs, I think it's one of those guys too. Quandre was just a niche player. Mm-hmm. Now in the NFL, they need those slot corners more than ever, so oh. he's almost perfect 
timing so, for him. I love him um, on Twitter. He's so awesome on Twitter yeah, daily. So I, I just think and, and, and Quandre Diggs' ceiling was really high. I just think that just means he has a really yeah. high ceiling. Doesn't mean that something won't happen that deter his his growth and development. But you can be right now kind of banking on that guy. Not only to be we talk about that bust rate and all that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. Yeah. So now he's, he's already, already a four time starter <laughs> as a freshman. Hell, man, he could be one of those guys, not only considered an NFL draft pick, but a guy that could have like a first-round type ceiling. And for just context of this team in this era, and just how you play modern players, younger, but also maybe what the talent, hell, 23 players in school history, and you had, what, seven you just said? Well, since 1992. Yeah, well, yeah since, 92. since 92. Since we've been but, tracking it. Well, you're talking about when you a third of them on this like current yeah. Tom Herman roster. That's yeah. pretty impressive to have it that is. many young players doing something that used to be maybe a once every five year type or once but, every three year type. But thank God for Charlie playing all those young guys mm-hmm. when he was here because now Texas is kind of a veteran team on the front seven. Yeah. Um, and in the back seven. And, That's because Charlie Charlie played Charlie Strong played more Freshman and redshirt freshman than any other coach in Texas football history because he had to, and that's the that's to. the difference yeah. though. That's mm-hmm. the difference. Charlie Strong well, they was also playing. Also, were the most talented guys on right. the roster, but for the most coaches, they had to, but right. also they won the spots. Like, and that's like, true. They didn't want. He didn't want to play all those freshmen, you, right? But when you, new coaches have to, yeah. right? But when you look at the depth now, Tom Herman's able to play a guy like Caden Stearns because you know what? He could roll with Chris Brown or John Bonney yeah. or any of those other guys. But guess what? He is the absolute best we got. We can't keep him on the bench. He's one of our best. That's why he's Bonnie one of our left. best safeties. Yeah. Bonnie was exactly. taking that two for the first week. Like, he was God. like, "Well, hell, I know way I'm beating this dude out. Yeah, <laughs> I need to go to Texas Tech. Yeah, <laughs> so I yeah, mean, not even for fifth year season. <laughs> right? awesome. yeah. You look on on, on offense at, at, at the slot receiver position. I mean, now you're starting to see. It's not confirmed by the school yet, but there's you know all kinds of reports out, and I've heard that it. At last check, it, he hadn't met with Tom Herman yet, but Davion Curtis is going to transfer. Now you're able to move Gerard Hurd outside to put depth at that Z receiver position because Deshaun Jameson and Joshua Moore have been so good during camp, giving you that dynamic, explosive playmaking element that you didn't have last year in the slot. That's what this 2018 class has done for Texas. I mean, it is across the board. It's either gotten you starting caliber players like Caden Stearns where you mm-hmm. didn't have them before, or now, Rod, at that slot position or at corner with Anthony Cook and Jalen Green, you've gotten really good depth where you didn't have it before. Uh, they got Honestly, I, I don't think they can afford And I guess they could afford the luxury. I don't know if you can redshirt Deshaun Jameson. No, they're not. I don't think that's going to happen. You know what I mean? I, I know there was some talk about like He might be a guy you can end up redshirting. First of all, he might be your best returner right now. I think he is. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Then you need him. Yeah. Like, he might be the best returner right now. And now you're hearing that since he's starting to show some you know, production in the slot and actually show some playmaking ability there, and I, I don't even know if they're still you know, working him both ways. Well, last I heard, the, that last week at camp leading up uh, to the last scrimmage, he was really, working strictly offense. Yeah, so you don't really need him on defense. It's kind of a luxury to play him on defense at this point because you do have a lot of depth there. Now that guys like Jalen Green have shown that they can play at a high level already, that 2018 class full of DBs is already overachieving. I don't know if you can afford to put Deshaun Jameson in that redshirt category. You need him back there returning. You need non-offensive touchdowns. You need field position. That guy's dynamic. He may have been. Somebody told me that he may be the. He may have been the best returner in the country, like coming out of like high school. Like he if he's that good, good. he like, was in the discussion. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like that, that's how. Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. If you're in that kind of discussion, you're saying the country, Monroe. not just a state, <laughs> but in the country, you may be the best returner. Then that's a guy that you know. You don't need to register the guy. That means he may be your Dante Pettis. Remember that guy from? Mm, I'll tell you this beast? about. Who was it? Dante Pettis. What's another name? He was a Pettis, though. I know that. It was Austin Pettis, I think. Maybe it's Austin Pettis. Yeah, for that was Boise. Austin the... Pettis. That's also a downtown. Yeah. yeah. They're brothers. Yeah. One plays for San Fran. That's the one the, who was just drafted. But was, I, don't I don't remember. I get it. One of those Pettis, Pettis brothers. Oh, Gary I know Pettis the Ashos. I, I know, know the that. McCoys. I know the Shipleys. I don't know those Pettises. They're not my people. Uh, or the McCordys. Right. Well, <laughs> when, you, when you talk about Deshaun Jameson as a return guy, Rod, and I know it's at the high school level, but – when you can field a kickoff or a punt and you can pull away from North Shore's guys when you're at Lamar and you're playing North Shore and you're the yeah. fastest guy on the field still, yeah. that means you can go. Yeah, I mean, and it's not, I don't say special teams and kickoff returns, one of those things where I think that the transition to the next level is, is seamless and a lot of times I think it's effortless for those guys because just, you're just an agent of chaos. You just know how to you know how to pick your way out in chaos. That's all kickoff returns and punt returns mm-hmm. are. They literally it's just organized chaos. You get down there and you find a way to make one guy miss, or you see, oh, I see a path where nobody else sees one. Whoop, whoop, whoop. 
you you reverse field whatever, and then you're gone. Nate, Nathan, Vash, I was I always ask Nathan Vash like, hey man, what are you chaos. what what are you seeing like when you're back there in the punt return and some gunner is like barreling down on you and he's trying to he's three yards away from knocking you down, but also the ball is like one yard from your face. What do you think? He's like, oh man, I'm thinking I catch the ball, make one guy miss, I got to do that all in like a second. But once I do that, I'm free. Yeah, like, zone. He's like, there's nobody that's going to catch me because I got great athletes like yeah. you and like Richard Hightower. And hell, back then it was guys like Tony Jeffrey on punt return. And we were going to block for him. Like, well, hey, if you give me a second to block my guy, I may not be able to you know, pull, pull a devastating block and take him off his feet, but I will shield him from you. Yeah. And that's what Nathan Vash used to do. So those guys are agents of chaos. I don't necessarily think the transition for them is as tough as it is at an individual position. Those guys can go from the high school level to the college level to the pro level because that's just a that's just an instinct being able to return. That's it. Some guys got it and some guys don't. It's just that simple. You can't you don't meet guys like you know what I'm gonna let him return stuff all of a See, sudden no. unless they're just a rare athlete. Usually you got that or you don't early on. Yeah, and I like, think he's one of those guys got a natural knack for returning. Man, he does. When you look at the Fozzie just, Whitaker was one of those kind of agents of chaos. Someone and that's just got type really of play. Don't. And you explained it perfect there with the chaos. But then the idea of confidence in chaos. The way that if you yeah. got to either be crazy. In chaos and be the one that, like yeah. the defenders and almost everybody else, yeah. or you're the one guy like Vashter that has so much confidence in the chaos yeah. that it's you're able to go. It's surfer mentality. It's going yeah. to the, it's swimming into that big wave. It, it, that's all returners are. They're, yeah. they're the guys swimming out. And you're like, damn, who the hell wants to surf that? And they go like, hell yeah. yeah no, the bigger yeah. the wave, and that's the, the mentality. That's the exactly it's what you're that explaining. Mentality. Some guys got that. Some guys are scared. To I'm scared to death sitting back there. It's like, you, you know got to be mean? crazy. You got to be like, crazy. It's like, no, man, I'm going to the end zone. Nah, you don't realize. I'm about to surf <laughs> this <laughs> big wave. Um, it's going to be awesome. Uh, th- th- that's literally how I am. Yeah, same same going back to Caden Stearns real quick and the numbers you threw out about true and retro freshman starting rod, that could actually be 31. I don't think it'd be, oh, it higher be yeah. than 31 because depending on what your base defense is to start that Maryland game, Joseph Osai could be your starting B backer, or you could start in that Lightning package and maybe BJ Foster's in that Joker role. Depends on what Maryland wants to come out in. Yeah. Yeah. Right or what, what package Todd Orlando feels most comfortable running. I think I, I tend to think if Jeff McCullough's back, if they get Jeff McCullough back from the strain pack, yeah. then I think he'll be he'll your starting in. he'll be your starting B backer and yeah, you'll he'll come, come out in the base nickel. nickel. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'll say. You'll come out in the nickel, I would think. But yeah, I mean if I don't know what Matt Canada's gonna do, nobody yeah. really does. That's actually one of the big mysteries. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That, that one of the advantages no, no, actually that Maryland has is the fact that you really don't know. You watch spring games and you can go watch film from LSU, but you really have no idea what Matt Cannon's going to do with that person. That's what Tom Herman said uh, yeah. said on uh, Monday. Yeah. He said, "Well, we'll watch some LSU film and watch, you know, their obviously you're their spring it. game you're to get a better idea of personnel." But yeah, it's your It's going to be a great test of this coaching staff and how well they cuz it's almost a lot of self-coaching with this. I agree. Yeah, you know what I mean because mm-hmm. you don't know really what they're gonna what they're gonna present. You, by halftime, you'll have been figuring it out with the game plan is how they want to attack y'all that. But now for the for those first two quarters, you need to know what your weaknesses are. How if you were Matt Canada working with the mean? principles that you know from the LSU and from the spring game and the the, the philosophy and the, the certain tent poles of his offense. How would you attack your team, mm-hmm. knowing that you lost Malik and you lost Puna and you lost Deshaun Elliott and you lost Holden Hill, all the losses and on, on stuff on defense? How would you attack right. a Todd Orlando defense, knowing his principles and what he his ideology? And the same thing on offense with their defense. So it's going to be a lot of self coaching early on. Last year, Texas failed that test. Miserably, they were out coached yeah. in that they game. Big time. But, but as more film was able to accumulate throughout the season, we found out this coach that was pretty damn good at breaking down right. the opponents. How good are they at breaking down themselves? I do wonder, Rod, and we'll get more into this next week when we talk about Maryland. I do wonder, does Tom Herman lob a phone call to Baton Rouge to Dave Aranda say, Hey, you saw this offense for a whole spring and a whole camp? It's already been done, and it's basically the same defense, it's pretty been much. Done. It's already yeah. been done. I would, Sorry, I would think so. Yeah, it's already it's already been done before that. Yeah, before they even start game planning and implementing stuff, which is probably going to happen this week sometime. Yeah. We assume for the Maryland game, uh, that calls already been made. I would think it, so. It, yeah, it's already they've already any and, and I can I can attest this because I know what happens in the NFL. The coaching trees. All right, that's the the point of the coaching tree is so that I can decipher and break down a coach's ideology, mm-hmm. so that I can go talk to somebody lower down on your coaching tree who may have been an assistant in a room with you and understands exactly what the principles are. That's why it's so much knowledge sharing and, and data sharing and coaching. It's because so that they know somebody on um, that, that 
Matt Canada coaching tree somewhere because it's such a small. It, it's a good old. Oh, trust network. me, there was a there was a reason going back a couple yeah. years. There was a reason Art Bryles was steaming mad when Charlie Strong hired Sterling Gilbert. Exactly. Yeah. Because now the secrets. Because uh, there's no playbook for the veer and shoot. The yeah. guys that know it know it, and that's it. Like yeah. that's what I was told. If you want that offense, there's certain guys you got to hire. You either got to hire Art yeah. Bryles, you got to hire Kendall Bryles. Or you got to hire Sterling Gilbert. That's pretty much it. You violated my inner circle now. That mm-hmm. inner yeah. circle. Philip Montgomery, yeah. Dino Babers. And it's, well, the same thing has happened with the air raid, right? That's how the yeah. air raid kind of got spread. It was like, man, what the hell? How is Texas Tech leading the Big 12 and passing every damn year, even when they're bad? What the hell is going on? All right, we got to figure out what Texas Tech is doing. And then, up, oh, start plucking quarterbacks and making them assistant coaches and coordinators. And now, now, hey, how about this? Now, everybody's in love with the freaking air raid. Because mm-hmm. look at the, all- the air raid quarterback yeah. is now the most popular quarterback in the league. Nick Foles, Patrick Mahomes, Baker Mayfield, mm-hmm. Jimmy Garoppolo. All of them. Remember the air raid quarterback used to be a laughing stock? Remember it was mm-hmm. a joke? It was like, those Texas Tech quarterbacks, they'll never last in the league. Now, Tim real Couch Greer, ruined the air raid quarterback. Yeah, now, Real Greer well, supposed no. to be the top quarterback in the country. Right. Nobody would because, ever see a Texas Tech quarterback, even if they led the country in passing, which they did plenty of times, uh, would never consider them the best quarterback in the country. Yeah, but no. now Will Greer, air raid quarterback, yeah. best QB in the league. Because look at all of Mike Leach's, look at all of Mike Leach's assistants well, now that have, yeah. that have had those quarterbacks. Sonny years, so. Dykes at Arizona Cal with Nick Foles Davis and then Webb. Davis Webb, uh, Jared Goff, yeah. and then Lincoln Riley at Oklahoma yeah. with Baker Mayfield, yeah, and then Seth, Seth Luttrell at North Texas, who they might have the best FBS quarterback in the state they in Mason Fine. Graham Harrell's their OC. Graham Harrell's the OC at North Texas, yeah. Yeah, so it's, they're all over they're the place all over now. The place, well, and yeah. that's what's that's so all, great about all, yeah. the, the whole idea that when you, you know, we grew up and watched and knew what we were seeing, but weren't necessarily in real time always interpreting it. And some people were at the right time. And what, when you just explained, you know, these coaching trees, it's sort of like a religion and you teach and then you exactly bring you around. Is. So now it's you look around, though. Dogma, but, what, yeah. but what was the issue that you had a lot of the time? Back in the day, it was new idea, new thought, and you had these people. What you think you came in, you invented football? It's like no, I didn't invent football. It's just a just new, it. a new version. <laughs> yeah. My religion's a little different than I yours, it. and it's the same yeah. type. Of, and what it took years though yeah. for the people at the top to accept it's, it, it's and taken accept like, new ideas, and it's just the same thing that happens anywhere across life. Anywhere, but it's yeah. happening in football in real time, and we're watching it. And it's crazy because. We're from Central Texas, and like in and '97, hell, mommy yeah. is from Texas. So, so but like, kind of think about this. Here, the think Air about Ray. like yeah, that yeah, decade from '97. Couch fools America, number one overall pick, yeah. just because he's going. And that's by, Leach and Mike. But, but yeah. by 07, 08, you had already Lake Travis and the Morrises, and like this idea of this quarterback factory starting with the Reesings and these guys. I'll tell you where it started. Then you got Art Browse uh, exactly. working at Baylor around that time, exactly. and coming from U of H, and also Steven Stevenville with the Reesings. Yeah. And I'll tell you, Craig Way saying the best high, best coaches in football are in high school. And he was saying that when I got into radio yeah. in 07, I was like, is and he crazy? It was no, before. Time, it was because too. he was yeah. talking about the Bryles network, or these networks of these trees that weren't accepted at the highest levels. But now we've streamlined the ability of these players to use the, what they've been able to perfect at a young age at the higher level. I'll tell you where it started before that. Uh, it started one of the smallest schools in yeah. Texas, one of the – one of the winningest programs at the small school level at Rogers and uh, mm. Lee Fedora was the head coach at Rogers. His brother's Larry Fedora mm. yeah. and Larry Fedora with Joe Wickland. Those guys, when they were at middle mm. Tennessee, they were running spread like a true spread offense. And Lee Fedora told me the story because my senior year in high school, Rogers knocked us out of the playoffs. And when we made the playoffs, Rogers beat us. Mm. And we're studying the spread. We're like, my, we're like, we're used to seeing like slot T offense. Like we ain't <laughs> never seen nothing like this. Like four wide mm. and the splits are all wide. Yeah. Bunch, it's like, Oh my God, they're just throwing it yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember Organized L- chaos. Lee Fedora yeah. telling me the story that he went to mid- to Murfreesboro to meet with his brother and the offensive staff, and on a van from Murfreesboro, Tennessee, back to Rogers, Texas, they installed the spread offense. Like, hey, we got 16, 17 hours of driving. Let's just install this offense. And Rogers, like, mm-hmm. in the late yeah. 90s and early 2000s, like, at the small school level, it's like, man, like, these kids from out in the middle of nowhere, like, they're running this offense. It's, like, sophisticated as anything you'll see at the college level now. Yeah. And that helped part of everybody. And everybody's like, oh, we can run some form of that. And some guys – and then it became the zone read. Like, well, hell, all Texas did was take their best athlete, put him at quarterback. That's what we'll do. We'll just yeah. put him in the shotgun, snap him the ball. They, empow- the they empowered programs with uh, lesser talent. Yes. Because the scheme could mm-hmm. uplift the level of play. Mm-hmm. And that's what the air raid has Elevates proven baseline. year after year. And Mike Leach even did it at the, at the highest level of the college game. You can manufacture that offense. I can go get a guy specifically tailored to this scheme. And if I get the right skill set in the slot or the right skill set at running back on the right skill set at quarterback, 
I don't necessarily need a guy with an NFL ceiling. Mm -hmm. I don't need a guy that's going to be an all-conference ceiling, all-American ceiling. I just need a guy that can complete these three throws. Get that production. Because <laughs> these three throws are 70% of my offense. Yeah. So can you really be good at, at throwing the, you know, the drag route? And can you get good at throwing this slant route? And can you get good at the, the, you know, the throw to the running back, the swing route? It's, and, it's, and it's crazy because we all thought, oh, man, that's just a gimmick offense. You, in the NFL level, it'll never be able to transition because it's too the, the athletes can can uh they they, they, they can overcome it because yeah. their athleticism is too much for that scheme to be able to resolve or to be able to uh, try to remedy but that's not true now we're finding out if you just add great players to an efficient scheme like that hell the patriots and the Philadelphia Eagles, they run air raid mm -hmm. concepts probably 30 40% of the time green bay mm -hmm. packers have been a spread offense for Six, seven years now. You know what Longer I mean? than that problem. So it's, yeah, so everybody was wrong. We were just right. wrong in the ignorance that that can't be at the NFL level because the athletes are too good at the NFL level, and they will find a way to uh, to basically kind of castrate all the uh, all the things that make the air raid, the principles that make the air raid unique. Yeah. And that's not true at all. As a matter of fact, the air raid is enhanced by great athletes. We found that true. out. Speaking of schemes and fits and quarterbacks, that's a nice segue to the Texas offense where Tom Herman, year two in the pro spread offense, to the surprise, which should be to the surprise of very few, uh, Sam Ellinger is going to be the starting quarterback for Maryland. And Rod, even though yeah. Tom Herman wasn't lying, and I don't think this was a, I don't think this was a, any kind of a farce of a competition or him putting the wool over people's eyes. I, Shane Bouchelle, from everything I heard, had a really good camp and a really good close to camp, but. When you look at it, Rod, if you want to kind of pick it apart, I just don't think the gap was ever that close between those two where one good week of camp was going to do it for Shane Bouchel to go win that job. It was going to have to be Sam Ellinger's play was going to have to tank drastically, and Shane Bouchel was going to have to raise his play consistently to a level well above that to win the job. And I think anybody that looked at this objectively should have realized that's probably very unrealistic to expect that to happen. I, I totally agree with you. Um, I think Shane would have had to be light years ahead of Sam yes. to win the quarterback competition, and maybe that's unfair. Maybe you're supposed to be just win it by a nose and still win it. But I think ultimately Tom Herman is smart enough to understand that practice is practice. And choosing a quarterback purely based on practice is like getting married uh, to a woman or a man without ever having sex with them. You, you, can, you can make that. You can do it. But ultimately, you are going to make a, a, a decision that is based on uh, a small sample size of information and not the entire overall picture. Mm, yeah. Because in practice, quarterbacks can't get hit. Not even they the know they one. can't get hit. You touch the quarterback in practice, you usually get cussed out and yelled at. You know how much comfortable that makes a quarterback yeah. in the pocket? Yeah. When I know I cannot get touched, the hell yeah, I'm gonna hit that six route mm -hmm. and I'm gonna I'm gonna throw I'm gonna lean yeah. into it. Hell mm -hmm. yeah, it's gonna be a great throw. And this is something that people haven't figured out, but <laughs> That we started hearing the Shane Bouchelle's closing the gaps uh, reports, and I even read two four seven, and you guys were reporting that you know that Shane Bouchelle actually getting some first team reps ahead of Sam, and even in that scrimmage, he did work. He, he started. Yeah. yeah, Sam Ellinger played. From my understanding, was very little in the scrimmage. I, I, and I, I think that's actually another philosophy. I think he was just trying to get trying to see a lot of what he, what he had with the second team guys. I think second. so. Yeah, but 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 I think that when you started to get the offensive line some continuity. When you start to figure out, okay, Calvin Anderson's our left tackle. And I like Denzel Okafor behind him. And we know Vahe at left guard and Shaq at center. And we know we got Elijah Rodriguez who's cross trains a lot of places, but he can play our right guard. And we, hell, we got two guys. Cosme uh, right now is one of the guys considering that right tackle. Or Denzel Okafor, I'm sure, can be considered there too. It's Kerstetter, Cosme, it's Cosme and Kerstetter right yeah. tackle, so which I've got, got a theory on that. In you a got two, three guys you can consider that right. can compete for the right tackle spot. So when you start to get the offensive line solidified, and then we started to hear, hey, running back reps now. Daniel Young, who you've had a man crush on for a long yes, time. I have. And Keontae Ingram, best running back in the state in the 2018 class. And Trey Watson, the guy who came over from Cal as a graduate transfer. They are starting to get the bulk of the first team reps split between them as a committee. So when the running, the, the running game started to gain an identity and the offensive line gained some continuity, that's when you started to hear around the same time the reports of Shane Bouchelle playing better. And to me, that's not a coincidence. No. Because Shane Bouchelle in 2016 proved that if you got structure around him, you got to give him a running game, 
give him all American left tackle in Connor Williams that was playing at that level in 2016, and an offense that is geared toward his skill set specifically, he can be playing like one of the best young quarterbacks in the country. And, and he did. And he did. Yes. And in 20, but, but the point is now with Texas, and Tom Herman knows this, and he actually elu- uh, alluded to it when he announced that Tom, Sam Ellings was the starting quarterback, we don't know what the offensive line is going to be. We just hope it's going to be better with Herb Hand and with the improvements. We don't know if the running game is going to be better, but we did infuse some talent, and we hope that it's going to be better. With all these hopes and question marks, okay, that you put Shane out there and the fit hits the Shane and your running game is suck and your, your offensive line is terrible, he's going to go down in flames, and we all know that. But Sam Ellinger... As a once again an agent of chaos, mm-hmm. he actually thrives in it. Yeah. Tony Romo style loves to improvise. He can actually manufacture yards. He can manufacture a running game when you don't have one. He can actually ki- extend a play when the offensive line breaks down in pass protection. He can extend a play and keep a play alive. Yeah. So all of the uncertainties right now about the offense, I think, work against Shane Bouchel and Sam Ellinger. They work in his favor because we know Sam can beat the Sam Ellinger show and put the team on his back. Now it may end up. Uh, you know, resulting in a couple of interceptions and maybe a fumble, but Shane can't do that. And mm-hmm. unfortunately, Sam can't. I think that's why he wins the quarterback competition. I do believe it was close later on in training camp, but I think Tom Herman knows that practice ain't the game. Well, and it ain't. You explained it perfectly there when you talk about just the skill set of Ellinger and just his upside, basically. The few things that yeah. Bouchelle can't, I mean, he can't grow the ability to be a little bit sturdier or extend a play with his legs or run. And the idea that Bouchelle, he fits almost perfectly as your backup quarterback when you look at a guy. You have more of an upside and your offense can extend plays. And then, best case scenario, look at the most valuable position in the NFL has become, the backup quarterback almost, that these guys mm-hmm. – getting paid huge and what is Bouchelle he's your collegiate version of a Nick Foles or of uh, say Colt McCoy that's a guy that you don't have to worry that okay well when our offense does change without our guy in there but now we actually still have a satisfactory to guy that's probably pretty consistent and even though it might be 85 percent and we can't go extending get extra plays we also may not have many mistakes and we may be able to as coaches elevate as you were saying earlier with scheme our talent and then if he understands in Bouchelle he's already been a D1 quarterback he might, he's about as ex- experienced he's as any quarterback in the quarterback league in the, or no in, in the, the conference yeah. like in the country almost in really if you think about it and uh, so overall when you combine all those factors to have that luxury as a guy especially when you hear that Cam Rising sounding like he's going to be somebody that could be a good backup quarterback to understand that at Texas we finally have a quarterback room maybe of depth where you've went a decade where, you know, you got lucky that Vince didn't go down after Chance Mock. You got lucky that Colt yep. didn't go down. And then we didn't get lucky for a decade. For a decade. And, like, literally it shows. I mean, exactly Colt right. goes down and then, like, this is the first time because we've had a, a, a crowded room, but we ne- haven't necessarily seen a room that is maybe full of guys that are at conference starter worthy power or better and we may have two and could emerge to have maybe three by the end of the year It'd be yeah. awesome. when Cole was here you had guys like Jevin Steed who would go on to start at other programs Trans and friend. DJ Kenny who would go on to start at other programs that's still so, yeah, seven you had, you had a quarterback competition Since and guys 08. were leaving you're always going to have that problem Clemson's got their problem Alabama's going to have their problem George, Georgia's Jeff, got their Jeff problem good to have. It's, it's more money more problems if you are a five if you, you are a blue problem. blood college football program you're supposed to have five star quarterbacks that come in and you out of your it. program it's the way it is. You want it. Um, Texas got to the point where it was a it was a competition by attrition. Yes, no. guys were just guys just couldn't earn the job. They couldn't. Booted. You know what I mean? And that's what Tom Herman doesn't want. He wants Sam to take the job. I think he gave it to Sam rather than Sam taking it. But yeah. I think that's the assumption that Sam's gonna take it to the next level during the you know during the season. But I mean, Texas has always had that problem. Even when I was here, Adam Hall, who came from Westlake, yep. transferred to San Diego State. You're going to have good quarterbacks transfer. There's nothing you can do about that. Yep. What Adam you can Dunn. do is uplift the competition level and the talent level in that room. That's why Cameron Rising is is high on Tom Herman's list. Yeah, He loves Cameron Rising because he knows, number one, Shane Bouchel's going to transfer. If not this year, he's going to do it next year. So I got to get Cameron Rising ready to go. I think, right by the, I think by the time we get to the bowl game, 
I think Shane Bouchel probably made his decision to grad transfer at that point. Mm-hmm. And I think Cameron Rising is your backup quarterback going into the spring ball. And he's already getting reps uh, yeah. in that regard. Yeah. yeah. Um, I feel good about the quarterback situation, guys. I, I By no means is it resolved or solved or figured out or anything yeah. of that nature. But I feel better about it. And when you look at the totality of the Big 12, Rod, it's, I'll, and this is our last offseason podcast, so I want to transition into some Big 12 and some national stuff. Tom Herman's named his starting quarterback. K-State's got a quarterback battle too close mm-hmm. to call between Skylar Thompson and Alex Delton. And I think those two programs, honestly, probably have the two best quarterback situations in the conference because the loser of that battle at K-State, whether it's Thompson or Delton, at least you've seen them in games and know yeah. they can get it done. Yes, yeah. And that's a luxury nobody else in the league really has. I want to go to Oklahoma for just a sec, Rod. Are you concerned at all that Lincoln Riley still can't name Kyler Murray a starting quarterback? Is this just Lincoln Riley wanting to mm. kind of have the element of surprise, a little gamesmanship, or Could should be there be some, some concern? That. I think most of it some is concern, I should say. he does – entitlement, I think, is something you don't want to creep into your program. Okay. And when you got a situation as unique as Oklahoma's with a $5 million quarterback who's making as much as the head coach, <laughs> yeah. All right, and who knows that he's going to be a pro no matter what you do or what you say. You can bench him right now, and he will go, okay, you know I'm going to play pro ball next year, and I'm going to start for the Oakland A's. Like that's gonna, I, think he, I think coaches freak out about um, entitlement, as they should. And I think if you're the, the guy at the natural leadership position for your team, your field general feels entitled in any way, form, or fashion – because you want the Baker Mayfield, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, you want the guy that basically is a walk on, was never given a damn Takes thing. We have to earn every little bit and every inch, every accolade, every merit. Uh, Kyle Murray actually is kind of the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> He's got a five star quarterback, got a scholarship at AM, didn't really like it. Okay. My dad helped me out, so I move on to Oklahoma. Okay. Uh, do I got a starting spot? Of course I do. I'm already drafted into uh, Major League Baseball, top right. 10 pick. You just, you, I think, I think he's freaked out about that young man being entitled, and I think he wants him just to earn everything. He's going to be the starting quarterback, no question. Right. I just think he, I think there may be some gamesmanship and all that kind of stuff there. I think he's freaked out about Kyler Murray just having having a big head. You know, what I mean, just having the big thing swinging out he's there. Got Twelve and more be, weeks with him, ha- and having a having basically a personality that could be even bigger than the head coach. And guys may respond to him, but because your quarterback is going to have guys going to follow him, he's right. a leader. Hey, you can have a you can have a possible mutiny in your locker room if the if the quarterback and the head coach on are on the same page because he's gonna have guys that are gonna follow him. So I think that's kind of what it's about. It, it's nothing to worry about. There's no way he's gonna name any other quarterback on that roster as a starter other than Kyler Murray. If he does, then the the, the fit will hit the shame. He's but, also a super data guy and just doesn't want to give info probably too. Let, let's look at the let's look at the Big Twelve as a whole, guys. When you look at Texas. Uh, I'll go ahead and ask to the question to start it off. Does Texas end up playing in the Big 12 championship game, yes or no? Uh, I just like the idea that there is one again. Sort mm, of got foreign to me for a little while. I'm going to say no. I got him at nine wins, so I'm going to say no. You got nine, Rod. Okay. I got him at nine wins. So I'm going to say somebody has double, you know, maybe a TC or somebody has more wins or somebody has a tiebreaker against Texas yeah. and they beat him out. It's just too early for that, but – I could be wrong. I got him at nine wins, and people think I'm too optimistic. So, Bobby Burton's got him at ten, and like Bobby Bobby's, got him at 10. Bobby's usually like the most like seemingly pessimistic. Yeah, yeah, he's very conservative when it will. comes to. He's, he's to, not a guy that no, he's but, not trying to make headlines. Yeah, he's not trying about to, this though. Yeah, shock jock. But football power index from ESPN. I read this at Horns two four seven. They got him at FBI ten wins. Is they 10 got the only one, two yeah. losses to two Oklahoma schools, and yeah. I'm like, that, they got Texas as a almost a ten point favorite over. Over over West Virginia, yeah. Who's, it's, the, who's an All American quarterback? Yeah, Matt, I want you to run down some of these lines. Yeah, I got quick, some updated we'll ones. No, even from last. People week. love Texas. I don't. I don't know what it is. We the fans and, and us analysts who are right here close to the Browns curtain. We are the most pessimistic about Texas. Everybody else is like, oh, Texas second year turnaround is happening. It's battered, Get ready battered, for it. battered media member syndrome. Could be. Could I be. think. I don't know. But I got yeah. nine wins, so I'm, I feel like I'm pretty optimistic. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'd say that Vegas, they're about to move it up to nine because it's at eight, it's and, at a eight half. and a half. It's still, but it, the juice is moving in Texas's favor, and all the lines have moved in Texas's favor except for the West Virginia one is at nine now. It moved a half a yeah, point towards okay. West Virginia because yeah. that line was new last week. But we've been following these back since May, and whenever Texas USC first came out was a one point favorite. Still yes. now it's at four and a half, so it's went five and a half points in Texas's favorite. So. 
That is huge. TCU is now up to a six-point game. Texas favored by six over TCU. That started at Pickham, so it's moved six points. That means it's moved a full point in the last two weeks, a half a point since last week's show. Then, since last week's show, also in Texas's favor against Oklahoma. Oklahoma started as a 12-point favorite back on May 24th whenever Las Vegas, they had a couple games of the year came out. Now, Sportsbook AG has... Texas at four and a half point underdog. So it's went seven and a half points in Texas's favor there. And then when you look around, though, at the Big 12, (laughs) say to win the Big 12, OU is still even money, but Texas, the clear cut second at two and a half to one. And then if you look below it, you have your West Virginia and TCU not far back in. And basically, if you think about it this way, Texas say you, I got Texas losing to Oklahoma, right? So Oklahoma is probably going to be in. There's going to be a way to get in. But now it comes down to tiebreakers against West Virginia, against TCU, teams which Texas is favored against. Now, if you think Texas is going to lose to Kansas State. That's your dark horse team that can maybe make it into that Big 12 championship game if you're throwing big money. But if you think Texas is going to win or follow Vegas, it's sort of as if Texas may have the tiebreakers against these other teams because they're favored against everybody else. So it comes down to being maybe another (laughs) Texas OU rematch in the Big 12, which would be cool. I wish we could have seen that. For like a awesome. decade when you played, because you would have had the second. We would have had it and, probably three yeah. out of the four years I played. It would have been, it would that have been a Texas until OU 08, Big 12 title game. It would have almost been that yeah. for like nine years <laughs> no, in right. a row. That would yeah. have been so cool if we just didn't have the regions and That's just a had great the point, actually. I never so what? About that, so right. what's your? Which would be really good for the Big 12 conference. Yeah, so huge. So and I've got Texas. Win. I can't go beyond eight wins with Texas. I can't go beyond I eight wins. Trust me, I feel you. What's your Big 12 championship game? Because mine, as of right now, oh. I'm gonna give Oklahoma the benefit of the doubt until they prove to me that they don't deserve it anymore. Yeah, they got some talent. They've uh, since Bob Stoops won his first Big 12 title. They've won 11 Big 12 titles with seven different. Quarterbacks. I just look at the skill talent. So, or, I look at the skill talent around a quarterback. I think the quarterback the doesn't best, really matter. The best. OU. I think you've got the best. With all due respect to David Montgomery, I think you got the best running back in the league. Ryan Anderson. Anderson. I think you've got the best receiver in the league. With Hollywood, well, actually with C.D. Lamb, C. I think he's most talented. Yeah. Hollywood Brown's probably mm-hmm. the most productive. Um, they, they usually figured out at tight end H back. They made these yeah. transitions before. I'm with you. Um, um, Defense is I, a concern. I like OU and K-State in the Big 12 championship game. I, I really, really like K-State. I know that sounds crazy. Yeah. Well, K-State's never a trendy pick to to be among the league contenders, yet they're always there every year. I just think if they get this quarterback thing figured out, and I tend to think it's going to be Alex Delton. If it's Alex Delton, then that to me, man, that is a – Typical blue collar Bill Snyder type team all the way around. Yeah, it's like 15 mm. years after the Sproles versus Oklahoma game that which came out of nowhere. And right now, if you were to get that 30 to one odds on K State, if you want to bet K State to win the Big 12, because then it comes down to just one gamer if yeah. it comes to that. Because the other odds below Texas at two and a half, <laughs> TCU's five and a half to one odds to win the Big 12. This is to go to that game and win it. And then West Virginia is six to one. Oklahoma State is eight to one. And Oklahoma is still your even, but yeah, that's the big drop off to twenty five to one Iowa State, and then thirty to one at Kansas. State. I'm gonna go with, um, I mean, because it's wide open. I don't think the Big Twelve's been it's wide open in a long time. I'll go with West Virginia. Got the best quarterback in the Big Twelve. They got an All American wide receiver who caught eighteen touchdowns. Uh, that they offense, Dana Hogerson may have his. A most prolific offense potentially since he's been there. If they can get running back figured out, right? then nothing, yeah, yeah, they could be good. So and they get and TCU at since, home, which is big on the which is big. Since Big Twelve started, nineteen ninety six, there have only been three Big Twelve champions. All right, who have been led by a a quarterback who wasn't a returning starter. So every Big Twelve champion since nineteen ninety six has had a returning starter at at quarterback, except Paul Thompson. Oklahoma 2006, Sam Bradford, Oklahoma 2007, Bryce Petty, Baylor 2013. So three times in 22 years has a team won the Big 12 with a first-time starting quarterback, not a returning starter. <laughs> so Will, Will Greer right now is considered a returning starting quarterback. He's one of the few in the Big yeah. 12. I'll go to West Virginia and David Sills to get it done. They'll be in the Big 12 title game. I want to put TCU there, but... I think Sean Robinson will struggle at times. And that Ross Blacklock injury concerns That's me big with their too. defense. Yeah, the yeah. D-tackle. We're talking about the central nervous system of that defense. Because I think they're, they're starting 11 defensively typically is as good as any you'll find in the yeah. country, but I still don't know how deep TCU is. Yeah, I, so I'm going to go with, and they got a new starting quarterback too. And when you lose a, a, like mm. a, starting, a veteran starting quarterback who won double-digit games, 
Dude, it's like losing a good woman. People don't talk about that enough. It's like lose when you lose a good woman, whether it, y'all needed to break up or not. Dude, it takes you a while to recover. Like yeah, it just yeah. does. Like that breakup, it takes a little. It's like damn. I didn't realize how good I had it. That shit used to do this and do that. Now I got to do this on my own and do this on my own. You, you realize, like, I don't want to get back with her, but damn, I miss her. I miss, I miss the this advantages out. of being with a good woman. Same thing with a quarterback. Dude, Kenny Hill won, what, 11 games? 10 games? He won 10 games? They were, they were, they were 10. They were 11 last year. They were 11. Year. Dude, dude, that doesn't yeah. happen a lot in the Big 12. You don't just win 11 games, okay? Mm. Um, Mason Rudolph, Oklahoma State, same thing. Even Oklahoma, Baker Mayfield, the greatest quarterback, arguably, in the history of the Big 12. Dude, it's going to be some type of setback there. Right. But I will take Oklahoma versus West Virginia in the Big 12 title game because no matter what, Oklahoma, different quarterbacks, whatever, that's one of those few programs like Ohio State, uh, maybe like Alabama, where it doesn't really matter who the damn quarterback is. Oklahoma's a, a football program that's going to pretty much be you know, in the running to win the Big until, 12 Until, again, like I said, that's where I'm at on, you, uh, uh, yeah. on OU, until they prove they're not. And, and right now they may have the best athlete at quarterback in the Big 12. Yeah, right. and one you, of the best in the history. Of the Matt, what's your big, what's your Big Twelve title pick? I s- still got Oklahoma, and I got Texas playing Oklahoma just because they get the tiebreaker over TC West Virginia. I never really thought about that till now, but I think that will end up happening because OU has to play at TCU and at West Virginia, so there's also the chance of multiple loss t- tiebreakers. It could be all crazy in the Big Twelve. It seems like it's always going to be oh, that crazy. Yeah. And then since you. Uh, Liked West Virginia and taking on uh, Oklahoma. Will Greer right now, fifth best odds to win the Heisman if you go down. Because yeah, if you look them. at the format yeah. of the Heisman, it's normally a quarterback winner. Sometimes you get a running back in there. And you got your obvious Bryce Love at the top with Tua. It's Bryce Love 6-1. to one. Tua's at 7.5-1 to one Alabama's quarterback. And then you got Jonathan Taylor and Khalil Tate at 10-14-1. and 14 to one. But right behind them. Is Will Greer at fifteen to one, and you also have Kyler Murray at twenty to one. If you think about it, if you're going to have a team win a conference the way that you sort of have to have a good team, and then yeah. the leader of that offense, and the Big yep. Twelve manufactures more offense than anything. Exactly and if right. it's a down year for the Heisman, it's better to go for the long shots than to go for like say Tua at seven to one or somebody like Love at six to one. You can go down to Greer at fifteen or go down to, right now Ellinger's at fifty. To one for Longhorn. We, we got about 10 minutes left in the show, and I want to get more into Texas in terms of the schedule next week uh, when we talk about Maryland and we, we preview that game and, and wrap up the, the offseason conversation. But right now, while we got time on the show, I want to go national just a little bit. We don't ever talk national college football, but I want to spend a, a few minutes here talking nationally. Uh, is a Big 12 team in the playoff, guys, yes or no? I say no. Um, ooh, I'm going to say no. I'll say yes. I'm going to say no. Because I think you're going to have two from the SEC. I think you have two from the SEC. The Big Ten East is a beast. And you still got Clemson out there. You got yeah, Clemson you got out there. I think Washington's going to be a good a good team this year. So, yeah, oh, yeah. I'm going to say Big 12's left out again this year. It's going to come down to either Pac-12 or Big 12 getting left out. Because, like you said, it's exactly. gonna, Alabama, Clemson's yeah. getting in. The Big Ten Big has five teams that could go. But <laughs> Ohio State is the clear-cut betting favorite if you look at teams like that and then look at pa- Pac-12 is going to go to Washington, but is Washington going to be good enough? It could be like the Big exactly. 12 five years ago whenever you end up having a one-loss team or something and you end up getting left out or just beating each other up or just have one late loss pull them out. So that's where the Big 12 championship game can really help the Big 12 team this year getting an added one to the schedule, something that wasn't factored into those schedules when Big 12 was getting left out of them back in the day. Let's go ahead and let's see if we can come up with some playoff picks. And I want to talk about uh, who you guys like in each of the conferences. I think we'll start with the ACC because that's probably the easiest one to pick. Mm-hmm. Do you guys see, see it being anybody but Clemson? Nope. Uh, I don't. Well, I mean, Miami, Miami could challenge him, I guess. In the I, I don't think game. Miami, in terms of talent, I don't think no. I don't think they're ready for that. They yeah. just don't have to play him until then, so they get lucky. Yeah. Like Clemson, Clemson's got four defensive linemen that are probably going to be in the top thirty-five or so picks in the draft. The top they got three, uh, three All Americans. I think two first team All Americans on the Associated Press. Uh, Farrell and Wilkins were both yes preseason. And one third team. All yeah. four will be first rounders. <laughs> yeah, no, no, all four is. are going to be first rounders. It doesn't make any damn sense to be that loaded. I agree. Um, so I think Clemson. And Rod, I don't want to say they're starting to get in that Alabama mold of man. Maybe oh, maybe you don't have to have dynamic yeah, offenses, they but 
Their talent looks yeah. pretty damn close of what you'd see from a really good Alabama team. Yeah, and, and they are there right. defensively, I'd say. Yeah. yeah. I'll so we, everybody, I guess Clemson and the ACC is, mm-hmm. is unanimous. Um, let's go to the Pac-12 real quick because you guys uh, are are you guys liking Washington that much? Because I'll tell you what, I uh, I really like Stanford. Winning the pack. I only like Washington um, because everything sets up in their favor. Yeah. I don't Got necessarily a starting like quarterback them. too. Yeah. yeah, I like that defense. I, listen, I, I think David Shaw Our is a damn field. good coach, but Chris Peterson is a good coach too. The weather, it, you know, Stanford. I th- you know, I think Stanford's schedule uh, may work out against them. Yeah, um, if you look at that schedule, that's a tough schedule. They've I, got a run right in October yeah. where they go at Oregon, and the following week they're at Notre Dame, Utah at home, which is which that's ain't always easy, yeah. yeah, that's always a tough one. Then a bye week. Then a kind of at Arizona State, uh, Washington State at home. Then they're at Washington. Yeah. Uh, then they're, yeah at Washington. But I like Bryce. They'll pro- uh, Bryce Love sh- probably should win the Heisman this year. I mean, he's that good. Uh, if he's that good, yeah, I did. I agree with you. They got a chance to win it. He's got to be that good though. He's got to dominate. I think he and will. I think he's That's and, of that. and I, I KJ Costello quarterback. I would. T- I'm taking Stanford to win the Pac-12. Right now, Stanford. betting odds you got uh, Stanford five to one and USC four and a half to one, and then. Washington almost a two to one, minus two hundred. Pac twelve title way. game. I'll take Stanford and Washington. Well, they're in the same division. Are they really? Yeah, oh, my bad. Um, I'll take. Oh, in that case, USC then probably has a better mm-hmm. chance then. In a rematch, mm-hmm. and I, I again, I just really like Stanford. Uh, I like Stanford winning uh, one of the Pac twelve. Let's go to the Big Ten because I think uh, I don't know if we're all in agreement. I think the winners are going to come out. Someone's going to be one of those really four teams from the East. You got Rod. You got four. Really, yeah. and I don't know where Michigan State ranked in the AP poll, but you got four top fifteen teams yeah. in the East Division of the Big Ten with Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan, Michigan State. Um, you know, Rod, I, I go by one of your theories, and I might torpedo your pick against your own theory, but I like your the the theory you kind of transcribed to, and I, I caught this when you guys were doing uh, on the horn. You guys did your college football roundtable. Yeah. Do you trust the coach? Do you trust the quarterback? Do you, mm-hmm. and, and how's the schedule? And when I look at that veteran quarterback i really like this head coach and i think the schedule works in their favor i take penn state to win the big 10 because Ooh, that's a Tra- that's a risky pick trace mcsorley is a veteran quarterback i think this is a prove it year for james Ooh, franklin Moorhead too and i and i think i but i think you'll see this year that penn state in terms of the way they've recruited i think this is when it starts to show uh the schedule works out for them because you've got three games now the pit game could be tricky but you've got really four games App State, Pitt, Kent State, Illinois before you play Ohio State and you get Ohio State, Michigan State, and Wisconsin all at home. Yeah, this is true. The Saquon Barkley effect, though, I'm willing to, I, I want to see that. I do want to see, like, uh, they were very, they were extremely reliant upon him yeah. last year. So, yeah, it's all about Trace McSurley's evolution as a quarterback. Right. They're going to depend heavily on him. And you got they Justin lose. Shorter, who was the top receiver in the country. Miles yeah. Sanders was a big time running back. And you're losing Joe Moorhead, man. Joe Moore is one of the best offensive minds in the country. True. I mean, that's he's kind of one of the RPO godfathers, if you will, in college football. That's good. You know, what I mean, it's gonna hurt. He's a he's not known as a great offensive coordinator, but a great play caller. As I as I've talked about in this show, those are two different things. He can, so when the the game plan goes out the window, you need a great play caller. He's one of those guys that can be a great play caller that knows how to fit the uh, the game plan real time to his athletes. Everybody can't do that. So anytime you're being a new offensive coordinator, Longhorn fans know this very well. It could be an issue. <laughs> yes. And, Jeff, your picks, you need to just throw $10 down on all these because you're picking all the ones that are, like, at least, you know, 30 to 1 or 6 yeah. to 1 or 8 to 1. You're picking some good odds. Penn State right have now. the lowest odds of no, those no, no. Out of the, out Michigan of the, out probably of the should be the – I like Michigan, honestly, dude. They're at 3 to 1, Michigan is. It's uh, Wisconsin at 2.25 to 1. Yeah, and then Ohio, Ohio State at yeah. 1.75 to 1. Yeah. And then down at 6 to 1 is Penn State. And down at 8 to 1 is Michigan State. So yeah, those yeah. are the two Michigan's contenders loaded, that dude. are. Michigan's loaded too this year, I'm telling yeah, you. 3 to 1 for Michigan. And basically it's going to come down. I haven't looked at the Ohio State-Michigan game where they play that. Uh, but it'll probably come down to that. I'll go Ohio State because of the odds. But that that's basically going to come down to home field and the bad weather games up there in the Penn State where you get who at what time. Yeah. So Shea Patterson. So who's your Big Ten pick, Rod? You like Michigan? I do, man. I'm a Harbaugh fan, so I'll take yeah. Michigan. Because if Harbaugh don't do it this year, then I don't know what year he's going to do it. Right. This is the year that he's loaded. He's got a veteran quarterback, so that's no longer an excuse. I mean, this is a guy that won. I mean, he's considered a bad season when he wins eight games. It's how high the expectation level is. 
won 10 games is where his first two seasons there. Mm-hmm. I think this year with a talented team, I think you see the best of Jim Harbaugh and a veteran quarterback. Matt, you got a big 10 pick. Yeah, it looks like I'll take Ohio State. Michigan does get a lot of games at home. Looks pretty good. Yeah, they get Penn State at home. They get also Wisconsin at home. They have to go to Nebraska. And then the Ohio State line, yeah. I don't see that. But, yeah, so I'll go with Ohio State. He can't, he can't beat Ohio State and Michigan State. If this is the year he's got. If he doesn't do it this year, then people are going to lose faith in Jim Harbaugh. I, I agree you know 100% I mean? with you. Uh, let's go to the SEC where I think it's clearly two teams and then everybody else. Yeah. Because uh, I'm not a big believer in Auburn. It's Alabama and Georgia. And this might sound sacrilege, but I – I'd take Georgia over Alabama. Interesting, you're not a you're you're not a believer in Auburn, who beat last year Alabama and yeah, Georgia. They got a they they got a they got a <laughs> and bring back their starting quarterback. They got with a, a D line that's loaded. Right, they, and Gus Malzahn is the only head coach in college football that's beaten uh, Nick Saban twice. Yeah, they got a lot to replace yet, on the I offensive don't line. In guy. They like, got a, well, they got a lot to replace on the offensive line, Rod. Yeah, they and do, but Gus Malzahn, your, that's what he does. What the third component is, hand too, this man, look at their Earth schedule. Hand. They open with Washington yeah, that's, in, that's in Atlanta. But remember last year they had site. a tough schedule. They, they, they barely lost to what, Clemson last year? Yeah, yeah I, I mean, think it was that last year. That's yeah. what they do. Like, that's their, 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 their powerhouse. Wash, Washington on a neutral <laughs> field. Game two, two weeks later, LSU at home, and then they're at Mississippi State uh, A&M November 3rd. They're at Alabama for the Iron Bowl this year. Uh, you know, who knows? I mean, I just just going to Starkville, having to go to Tuscaloosa. They're at Georgia November 10th. Washington on a neutral field. I agree. Man, that is a... Every year. You talk about schedule. Yeah, the SEC, SEC Exactly. Like, the SEC West, every, every team has that other, schedule. All what of them. Mean? Except Bama. You can say that about every team in the SEC West. Oh, hell, man. They got to go here. Hell, and that's why you go, go with Bama. That's the SEC West. That's Bama's the only Bama. team that really you don't give a damn well, about. That's, what's what, that's SEC why West. I like Georgia, because you look at the way Georgia's schedule. They got I mean, they're at South Carolina the second week. Exactly. They're at South Carolina second week of the season, which is their toughest game. Mm-hmm. At who knows what LSU is going to be on exactly. October thirteenth. That's a good point. Uh, and then they get Auburn at home. Like it's really the neutral side. Who knows what Florida's going to be in damn moment? No, I think they but lose. But it's interesting that you just said <laughs> like, you guys tossed Auburn out there. Like ah oh, man, I don't respect it. It was like well, I mean, I think they deserve to be in the conversation. They literally. Beat, That's why they were angry beat, last he's year. He beat Nick Saban twice. How many people do you know has beat Nick Saban twice? No, I I get that. <laughs> he, he's a great coach. I, know yeah, that. he's got a returning starting quarterback. They beat Georgia last year. I mean, what do you, what else do you? Want I'm just looking at the Aub- the Auburn just, trends, Rod. Just, they're just so just, up and down. They like are, they're not they consistent are. from one year to the next. Yep, so that's a great point. Basically, prove it to me is what I'm saying with Auburn. Okay. If, if look, if Auburn wins ten or eleven games with that schedule, hell yeah, they're in the playoff. Mm-hmm. Yes, for sure. Well, every year is about them just beating Bama. They can beat Bama. They yeah, but you got Washington on that schedule. You got Georgia. That's what they messed Georgia on the road later in the year. No, and I this agree, but one, one I, know, I thought you were being disrespectful to Auburn. I don't know why I'm taking up for Auburn, but like, yeah, I mean, Rod's Auburn like last year. You could argue Rod's Auburn. like war damn eagle. <laughs> no, but Auburn is because last year Auburn did get totally screwed when you looked at like who well, they no, beat and then they didn't. I get don't in. care. But I, I just thought, I, I just crazy that you just dismissed them like them. Like damn, Gus yeah. Malzahn's a beast. So man. I like, but I like Georgia. I like Georgia winning the SEC. I, well, just uh, based on your points, yes, I agree with you on that. Them making it to the SEC title yeah, game and we, playing in the East. So who's so, so who's your four teams in the playoff? I got Clinton, Matt, Alabama, Matt. Ohio State, and OU. Okay, yeah. Rod, who you got? I'll take. Ooh, that's good. I'll take Clemson. I'll take Bama. I'll go with Michigan then, since I'm taking them over Ohio State and Washington. I'll go Georgia, Alabama, because I think Bama's still getting in the playoff. Uh, with a loss in the SEC championship to Georgia. So I'll go Georgia, Alabama, Clemson, Penn State. I went Bama, Clemson, Washington. So leaving out the Big 12 yeah. and Pac-12. So I'm, I'm leaving out the Big 12 yeah, I'm, I'm leaving out the Big 12 I can see that too, man. The SEC and the Big 10 mm-hmm. can each throw two teams in there. And yep. you still got I, Clemson. I see that. You still got and Clemson. And you still got Clemson. No, no, I'm with you on that. Actually, that, that I can see that happening too. That's not unrealistic. That's why we're going to start to hear, let's expand to six. And we should well, be already at heard six. It. Barry yeah. Alvarez, the Wisconsin uh, I uh, want AD or whatever, he's already said he wants six. Ever since day one, he should have won six a long time ago because Wisconsin will always get screwed. It always seemed like the best fit when you had. Had one and two always playing. You want to reward one and two, so give them the bye. Let three play six and four play five. You can keep the traditional schedules and weeks and all that and go that way. So we, we'll do the schedule game with Texas next week, but let's go ahead and just we'll figure out how we get there next week. But Rod for Texas, no Big 12 championship, no playoff, but you're down for nine and three in the regular season. I got him in nine and three, man. I'm not, I think Jerry Palm had him in the Sugar Bowl and his bowl projections versus Georgia. 
Yeah. Was, I'm like, I thought I was being a homer. I, I feel good about my pick now. Matt, <laughs> Matt, win, win loss record for I Texas. I think I'm going over eight and a half. So going with the nine and three. That's where the Vegas money's headed. And you look at the schedule; it works out when you're favored in eleven of the games. That gives Texas to underperform twice, which is. Tom Herman hasn't done that yet. He's actually overperformed yes, in has. all good games. Yeah. Even against yeah. like opponents, he normally performs. You've got to worry about maybe stubbing your toe like you did in Maryland than those well, type of games. Or Sam having a, a, a terrible game like yep. Vince has had as a sophomore. And so exactly. Did, you know, so those are the type of things where, Sims, yeah. oddly, Texas fans at home be fearful that you might see a random loss that you end yeah. up ruining a season. And those, But that means you're back to where you want to be as a Texas fan because that's whenever it surprises you. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, it would ruin your day. Good point. That doesn't happen anymore. They don't, they're just that. Saturday. So we will pick this up next week. We'll do schedule game next week. We'll talk about any kind of depth chart issues that might still be out there after Tom Herman's Monday press conference. And uh, we'll have a special announcement probably next week or maybe by oh, the time right. this show airs yeah. next week, we should have some sort of special probably announcement it out for you that. guys. Yeah, it'll probably sure. it'll be on the Twitter machine or at Horn 24-7. Uh, before next week's show, but we'll get all that figured out. And we will break down Maryland because next week we've got a game to talk about. Matt, thanks for everything, man. More than welcome. Rod B., appreciate the time and the knowledge. Anytime, brother. For Matt, for Rod, for Travis, the best damn videographer in the podcast game. For everybody at the Austin Radio Network and 104.9 The Horn, 104.9 FM, 101.9 FM, AM 1260. Stream on Worldwide on the Horn app and at hornfm.com where you can hear Rod B. each and every weekday from 1 to 3 on the Rodcast. Shameless plug. And thanks to Matt, you get this show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, anywhere you get your podcast and always get our archives on the Longhorn Blitz SoundCloud page. Yep, just type in Longhorn Blitz. For the Horn family, for the Horns 24-7 family, I am Jeff Howe. Thank you so much for downloading and listening, and we will catch you again on the next episode. You've been listening to Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Remember, for the latest Longhorn news 24-7, visit Horns247.com.